Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems. In this podcast, we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health, innovation to sustainability to the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. But not forgetting as well how history, art and culture can transform our understanding about science. My name is Elin Rhys and I am delighted to say that with me is Dr Rian Heath Mira, Senior Lecturer in the Geography Department at Swansea University. Welcome, Rian. And I'm also excited to say that we're going to be talking about volcanoes. Yeah. And one volcano yes. in particular, which led you to wonderful fieldwork in the land of ice and fire yeah. um, to Iceland. Tell me a little bit about that volcano that's grabbed your attention. Yeah, so I've been looking at a volcano called Eldfet, um, which erupted way back when in 1973. And I, I got involved with this eruption because I got a grant initially to try and set up a geography field trip. This is the best way to get money towards doing things. So I got some money from the Cola Camai Kenneth Lethal, so we have to give them a nod to about, for myself and two of my colleagues, one from biosciences, another from geography, to go out to Iceland and do a bit of a recce, see if we could set up a new field trip. And while we were doing that, we had a day to an island called Heimei, just to the south of Iceland. And when we were there, we just kept seeing all these cool things. Like we knew about this eruption. We could, you know, we could see the volcano. It's a huge mountain on the island. But we kept seeing things like little signposts or things that looked a bit like headstones. We tried to work out what they were. And it became apparent that these, these things we could see, they were memorials, not just to the eruption 50 years ago, but also to life before the eruption. Because this volcano erupted... And it covered like a third of the town, about 400 houses with lava from this volcano. So after this eruption, the whole town, the landscape, the community was changed forever. And that's what we were seeing was evidence of this. And it, it really got me thinking about what's the long term impacts of volcanoes on people, on communities? Taking a step back then, first of all, where did your passion for geography and your passion for volcanoes start? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've always kind of liked being outside. My parents love going hiking and, you know, out in the rain. So that was quite normal to me. You know, when I was about 12, back in the late 90s, my parents said, we're going on holiday to Iceland. You know, that's quite a normal thing to say now. People go on holiday to Iceland, have honeymoons to Iceland even. <laughs> but back in the 90s, that was quite unusual. You're supposed to go places like Tenerife. Mallorca. Costa del Sol, you know, <laughs> nice places. But uh, I, I am ginge, <laughs> as is my brother. So my parents were less keen on going hot places. They thought, no, you know, we like being outside. We like hiking. Let's go somewhere cold where sun cream isn't so much of a problem. So we went to Iceland. And it just blew my mind. Like It's such a beautiful place. The landscape is wild. There's all these volcanoes everywhere, glaciers. You know, if you're going to be interested in the outside world, that's the place to be interested in the outside natural world. So I take it that that particular holiday was what <laughs> sowed the seeds for your interest in geography and your yeah. career thereafter. Yeah. So, you know, from there, absolutely GCSE geography. We were really lucky to go again after I finished my GCSEs when I was 16, sold then all my A-levels. I went to uni to do geology and then I was lucky enough to get a PhD in Edinburgh. And that PhD was looking at kind of chemistry and science, geology of Icelandic volcanoes. So I kind of rent up, got everything I needed to do there to then become a volcanologist. <laughs> it's a grand title. Yes. <laughs> and your, uh, your career... After that, you've be, become a senior lecturer eventually. Yeah. And how did that progress? Yeah, so I finished my PhD. I came to Swansea then to do a postdoc. I was working, looking at micro ash. So you have these explosive eruptions and you get this volcanic ash that comes out. Some of it's big, some of it's small. But I looked at the really small parts way out in the Greenland ice cores linked to things like climate change. So I did that for a little bit. Then I got really into teaching at university. So I've been doing that for 12 years now. And then after I came back from maternity leave, I kind of thought like I've enjoyed teaching, but I'd like to get back into research. And that's really where this project kind of started growing and going back to Iceland and doing the things that I wanted to do there. 
you're a scientist, right? And it just seems to me that this project was was not so much about the science, but more about the people. Yeah. A- am I right? And was that okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's been a bit of a, a weird jump for me. We in geography, we we tend to be uh, we're in clans. You know, there's the geologists, there's the physical geographers, and then there's human geographers, and we're all you're a united front against everyone else, but we do have a bit of in squabbling. So uh, for me, it's, it was quite strange to go from being kind of mega science, chemistry, physics, to suddenly going to cafes and chatting with people. <laughs> it's been lovely, <laughs> but it has been a bit of a, a mental and a cultural shift for me. But it's been fascinating and it, it's kind of made me realise these you know, we tend to fall into silos, don't we? Of kind of, well, I do this over here and you do that over there and we don't talk to each other because we're from different fields. But actually there's so much to be gained by crossing those boundaries, working together, being interdisciplinary. And it's, it's really changed how I've seen volcanoes, eruptions and, you know, the short versus long-term impacts of those events. So tell me then about that particular eruption. What happened yeah. when the eruption took? Yeah. Did they know it was coming? So this is the interesting thing. Back in 1973, there's no monitoring really in place. We don't actively, proactively monitor volcanoes. There's no seismographs, for example. And they're really important because to know if there's an eruption coming, you basically look at what the land is doing. Is the land going up or down, which shows stuff is kind of accumulating underneath. Earthquakes show that there's magma collecting. We think there's going to be an eruption. That's normal now. But in 1973, there was nothing like that. So at two o'clock in the morning, everyone's asleep or going to bed. Suddenly this eruption starts on the island completely unexpectedly. And for a scale, you know, we're we're working on an island that's sort of about 10 kilometres off the mainland. The whole island is about a mile and a half across and three miles long. That's not a big place, you know. So for suddenly this eruption to start, and it opens up about 100 metres from the nearest building. This is a scale that is just hard to comprehend, you know, an event that you didn't see coming in a place you weren't expecting it to be on a small island of 5,000 people. So within about four hours, they've evacuated everybody from the island. How? When, where did they go? <laughs> brilliant, brilliant question. So as it happens, the night before the eruption, there's, there's really poor weather. So this is a fishing community and a lot of the people who live there are in heavily involved with going out into the sea and doing kind of industrial fishing. But because of the bad weather, they've come back the day before, they've docked in the harbour. So there's about 70 boats available, fishing boats. And so the four and a half thousand plus people on the island are evacuated within three to four hours on these fishing boats, you know, and the smaller ones, they take about 30 people. The bigger ones, they take up to 200, 300 people with them. And, you know, we're talking even simple things, right? A lot of the people who were evacuated were pregnant. So, you ha- you know, you're not just leaving the island, you're going on a boat pregnant. Oh. And there's discussions about, well, what happens if you go into labour? And I, I spoke to one lady who did go into labour and they decided that she couldn't go on the boat because she was too close. And so she had to go back up and go on a helicopter and be taken to the mainland by helicopter, you know, so... It's not even just as simple as getting people to leave. It's thinking, what do you need to take? What, How long what do you for? take with you at a time like that? Yeah. Well, this is one of the questions I've been asking people. You know, when you left, what did you take with you? And the overriding answer is, we didn't know we were leaving. We knew we were going, but we didn't know we were leaving. No, for how long? Yeah, yeah, we assumed we'd be back tomorrow or the day after. So... Most people left in their pajamas, you know, with their coats on. If you had a baby, you took a bottle of milk and some nappies with you. Didn't take a pram because, you know, we're coming back tomorrow. What do you take? Do you take your purse? You know, we've not got digital money. We've not got digital photos, anything like that. You know, so most people left assuming they were coming back and they took the bare essentials with them. But for most of them, they then didn't come home until the eruption finished. When was that? Well, it started in January, the 23rd of January, and it's officially declared over on the 3rd of July. So kind of five months. And for those of them who had gone, there were options to come back and get things. But then you have this complicated setup of who comes back and what do they prioritise? And some, some people stayed then. Yeah. So what did the people who, who remained, what did they do? Did they try and, I don't know, stop? But things yeah. getting destroyed. So most people left in the first few days. About a hundred people stayed behind, and those were either police, firemen, 
medics or people involved with the town council. And then over time, more people come, you know, the first few days to weeks, more people are allowed to come back. And they're basically rescue teams, you know, because this volcano has erupted 100 metres from the town. There's ash coming out, there's lava coming out. They need to rescue as much stuff as possible because those houses might be gone within days, within hours, you know. So they're rescuing tellies, toilets, beds, cupboards, anything you can find, anything that can be taken is taken and then sent to wherever the people have moved to or, or been stored in the meantime. Didn't they try to stop the lava flowing? Yeah. So this is really cool. If people have heard about this eruption before, mm. this is probably why. So normally we just tend to let volcanoes do their thing. <laughs> yeah, you don't stand there and argue with it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but mostly volcanoes are like a bit further away, so we can allow that. But here it's not just close to the town, it's close to the harbour as well. And you know, this is a fishing village. If we lose the harbour, even if everything else is fine, there's no going back. So as the lava is coming out of the volcano, as it's progressing down the hill towards the harbour, they kind of come up with this plan of like, well, we've, we've got to fight. We've got to try our best. So they set up this system of pumps and it's an island. So they're surrounded by cold seawater. And what they do is they, 24 hours a day, they pump cold seawater onto the front of the lava flows. And that maybe that sounds like a ridiculous thing to do. But the idea is lava is just melted rocks. You know, they get so hot that they turn into liquid. So if you can cool them down again, then they turn back into solid rock. So the idea is if you can put this cold water over and over and over the front of the lava flow, it will cool down and it will turn into rock. And did it work? Yeah. Wow. So as it turns into rock, that really it becomes like a barrier, a barricade. And anything behind it that's still melted in the end should kind of potter off in a different direction. So they did this for days, weeks at a time, and it worked. So now if you go and visit... The harbour is still there, it's still open, but it's actually better now. It's more shaded from the wind coming in off the sea, you know, so it's it's really actually helped. So when the people came back, you, you know, what did they do? Because, I mean, when, on, on reading your paper, one of the things that fascinated me was how they wanted to remember what had happened. Mm. It wasn't a case of putting it behind them and moving yeah. on. They actually, you know, kind of made some kind of... Um, commemorative island, isn't it? Yeah. So if you were to go and visit now, it's it's almost hard to conceive how bad it was in 73. You know, if you go to the museum, you can see all these lovely pictures that show how deep the ash was. So before you can come home, you've got to clear the ash. There's sort of anywhere between a metre and seven metres depth of this volcanic stuff that you've got to clear away. But now when you go, there's a lot of kind of ways to remember, not just the eruption, but life before the eruptions, if you go for a nice walk across the lava flows, for example, you'll see almost like headstones for lost buildings or lost homes. You'll see these wooden signposts and those are the street signs from beneath. So wherever you see a street sign here, beneath you is where that road used to be. And they have a lovely festival at the start of every July. It's called Gorslokahautiv. And it, that means the end of the eruption festival. So every year on the anniversary, they have this big party. There's a concert. The president might come and give a talk, you know, um, they have garden parties, art displays, things like that, There's a, a children's sports festival, things like that. So they they are, haven't moved on, you know, they, they've kept hold of this event. It is now a key part of their saga, you know, their story, but it doesn't impact everyday life. You know, they, they're still striving forward. They are a lively living community. But this is a part of who they are now and they commemorate that going forward. So they're not kind of living in the past? No, I don't think so. It's quite easy to do that, isn't it? You know, it's quite easy to let it become, this is who we are. And they are known as this, you know, amazing community who defeated a volcano. You know, but there's so much more than that as well. But it is your story. Of course, you're going to tell your story. Why not? But the, the town itself is still there. It's still lively. It's still moving forward. So how did you do the research then? Obviously, you went round and you looked at the place and I've seen your wonderful photographs yeah. in the paper. What did your research involve? It's been really interesting because normally I'm a scientist in my, back, my trade background. So I'm used to being in a lab, you know, or maybe climbing up a mountain, collecting samples and bringing them home. But this has been really different for me. I've been talking to people, you know, having interviews with people, going to the festival and joining in and, and being a part of that. Well, even just going for walks across the lava flows because it's about understanding the environment and getting your eye in and observing things. 
And, you know, so you go for a nice walk and you'll see this. So you take a photo and you see that. And the more you identify things, the more you can build that jigsaw of what you're seeing. And I've also done lots of work in the archive. So I've never considered myself a historian before. But all of a sudden, you know, I'm in the library and I'm going through these past documents. And I like was there about three weeks ago and I got given a box of photos and I spent the afternoon looking at old photos that had been taken during the eruption. And it is so far removed from what I've done before, but it's been really interesting and really enjoyable. Just getting to know the place, getting to know the people, you know, and you can't just rock up and go, hey, tell me your story. It's about building that connection and building a network where people will trust you with their story as well, because it's a lot of personal content it's a lot of emotional content you know there were a few people that I really wanted to speak to because I'd seen them in photos for example they didn't want to talk really why not yeah just it's done like oh. that was 50 years ago like it was very intense it was very emotional I don't want to talk about it whereas other people like oh yeah you know, why not <laughs> but there's <laughs> a generation I guess who, who don't remember it at all yeah so 50 years ago now yeah. so anyone that you want to speak to with first-hand experience, has to be 55-ish or more, you know, because they were children back then. But the really important and interesting thing is, you know, these stories are getting lost because 50 years is a long time. I had an interview booked in with a guy called Outney and he was a journalist during the eruption and he was from the island. He was the font of all knowledge. And he died a week before I got there, two weeks before I got there. He's written books and things, so I still have a lot of his newspaper articles and his books that he's written, so I still have his story. But I don't have his version of his story because he was in his late 70s, you know, and these things happen. So that's been a really interesting part of this is, you know, being able to engage with stories that have already been collected and sort of archived by the community, by the island. But also I can speak with people who haven't contributed before and I can go to them and collect their stories and then give them back to the community as well. Nobody actually died during the eruption. It wasn't, it wasn't like Pompeii, for instance. <laughs> yeah. So during the evacuation, there were not, not many injuries and nobody died. Over the course of the six months, one person did die. He was a young man called Ursi. And he died because he went to a building uh, during the eruption. He went to get some medicine from a building. And very sadly, that building was all full of volcanic gas. And you can't see the gas, you can't smell it, but it will overwhelm your body and, and that killed him. So he wasn't killed sort of by the eruption, but he was killed as a consequence of being there and because of those gases. So it's incredibly sad. But other than that, there were no major deaths, you know, and it's fantastic to think this huge event has happened unexpectedly. It's gone on for six months. It's, you've lost a third of the town. And yet as a community they haven't had to suffer that loss, you know, which is fantastic. And I think really contributes to why it's OK to come home. Aren't they afraid that it's going to happen again? There was one in the news recently mm. um, of, of an eruption in Iceland. Aren't they afraid? You know, they're on an island. There's not many yeah. places to escape to. I've asked that question a lot. And I'm surprised that the answer is kind of not really, you know, because... Now, when you think about it, the difference is technology has improved, science has improved, our understanding has improved. So there would never be an unexpected eruption again. So there might be an eruption again, but they would have several weeks to days notice. So there might be that loss of possessions or town again, but they would always have that time to gather what they want and to get to the mainland yeah, so safely. What do you take? What would right? you take? <laughs> yeah, this is a question I've really thought about because like, one of the things that I get from the people I talk to is like, well, what did you take? And, you know, the initial thought of, well, we, we didn't know we were leaving, so we didn't take much. But then people come back to rescue and it was mostly men. And the general stories are, you know, that the men come home and they phone up their wives and they go, don't panic. I've got the telly and the microwave and the bed and the cupboards and blah, blah, blah. It's all fine. We can start again. And the wives go, OK. And did you get like the wedding photos and the baby photos? <laughs> Memories. And, you know, like little kiddo can't sleep without his cuddly. Did you get the cuddly? And they're like... No, <laughs> but I got the expensive things. And the women are like, expensive things are on insurance. We can have a new microwave when we get our insurance. We can never get the wedding photos back. There's a PhD <laughs> thesis. And not, oh, absolutely. And there was one, one girl said, um, well, she was a girl then, obviously. She'd said she'd gone with her dad because he couldn't be trusted. 
And so she'd gone with a, a rucksack for every person and gone into each bedroom in the house and filled them with special books, special toys, photos, everything. And then before leaving, she'd gone all the way down to the kitchen. She said she'd had to climb into the house through the attic, you know, top window because it was so buried by ash. They could only get into the skylight. So before she left, she went all the way back down to the kitchen and rescued a plant pot from the kitchen windowsill. And she said, like, well, to me, my memory of home is my mum growing herbs, like, on the kitchen window. That's that's home, oh. you know. So I couldn't take them all, but I could take one. So I took one and out with me. And she said, like, she got back home to the mainland and gave, like, presented this to her mum. And her mum burst into tears because she, like, she had understood that, yeah, to her, home was her also yeah. in the kitchen cooking and, she got you know, the growing this, like that was her it. thing. Oh. And she knew, yes, it would be lovely if you'd had all six. But the fact that you knew one would be important to me meant everything, you know. So it's really fascinating. I was thinking too from a, <laughs> oh, I don't know, from a geography point of view mm. or a geology point of view. Yeah. The landscape must have completely changed then. Wouldn't it have gone from sort of... Of what fields or whatever to yeah. to just lava to rock. yeah yeah so the whole area that was lost was partly town partly farmland even as simple as after the eruption there was no formal farming afterwards you know, so there's some hobbying you know there's some sheep here and there and some horses but no more kind of livelihood farming in that area there's been no cows there for fifty years you know and, and yeah the landscapes totally changed like there used to be one mountain. And now there's two, you know, <laughs> and you used to be able to see out to sea and see all the other islands. And now there's this big wall of, of black lava and it's beautiful. It's covered in lupins and flowers and dandelions and things and there's birds everywhere. But it, you find this interesting conversation of what should we do with it? And as a as an incomer, as a tourist, you go... Leave alone. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful like it's a volcano it's beautiful and the tourists are coming in every day but from a local perspective you know, they're on an island they've only got limited land that they can use for housing and things like that and you find then that like not always but sort of the younger generation tends to go leave it be you know this is the landscape this is what we've always known our island has two volcanoes and, and along with the rest but also it's got flowers and animals and there's birds nesting. Like this is an ecosystem. You have to leave it alone now. Whereas a lot of the older generation, and not everyone, but a lot of the older generation were like, well, but this is a, a blight, you know, like there shouldn't be two mountains and we could clear all of this away and we could rebuild and we can do, we could use that land for something more, like more interesting or more important. And, you know, some people are saying, well, I know it's been 50 years, but I will never accept that landscape. Like, that's not my island. That is just filth that's come out and ruined everything. You know, and not everybody came home. Yeah, I was going to ask, why Why did they come back if they felt that way? Yeah, again, it's coming back to that cultural question because these are islanders, you know, they've got this long history of being there. Their families go back generations. They're used to tragedy because they're a fishing community. They They regularly have lost people to sailing. Other events have happened over the course of those generations. So... Although maybe to the outside world, this is this huge, tragic event that impacts the island. It is for them, but also it's part of it. You know, it's part of life. And we've come back and we've moved on. And they have this lovely quote in Icelandic. It says, Theta redast. And it basically means everything will be okay in the end. You know, so this is a blip and we'll come back. And, um, you know, the eruption starts in January. It finishes in July. By September, the school is open again. Goodness. You know, and... So many people, you said to them, well, why did you come home? You know, if you see the pictures, there's sort of metres of ash. The houses are all covered up and they go, well, where else would I go? This is where I come from. You know, this is like, this is everything to me. Like my bones live here, you know, and and there, there's never any question that they would go and live somewhere else. But not everybody, you know, if, if you, for example, those who lost their homes, it's quite a different story because it's not just that you're coming home to a different island, you're coming home to a different island and you've lost everything. There's no reason for you to come home. And a lot did and a lot didn't. So there's a lot of kind of confusing emotions to do with that. But what we find is that they have this festival in July to celebrate the end of the eruption. And a lot of the folks who didn't come home to stay, but they do come home for that. So once a year, everybody kind of comes back to the island and there's this big celebration. And, you know, it's like a reunion every year. So even those who didn't come home, there's still that really strong cultural connection to that island. 
And you obviously love it. <laughs> and they must know you terribly well by now. <laughs> <laughs> I joke that I'm an islander now. <laughs> I'm one of them. It's really nice, you know, because I've been sort of three or four times like every year in a row to go back. And that's nice because you go the first time full of questions and you answer all your questions. And it's not until you get back that you realise that you've actually got 10 more questions based on what you asked last time. So it's nice to go back again and again to really build up. But this year was really interesting. I went back to do some filming with a different group and we had some of my contributors come and contribute to that filming. And it was just lush because I knew them, you know, and it wasn't just me talking to a random. It was me talking to Helga about her story, you know, and then Outnod coming in and, and Sigrun coming in. And it was really nice to go back. And, and at one point I was sat on a bench just having some quiet time. And somebody drove past with a tourist bus and they waved at me because they knew who I was. <laughs> you kind of That's thought, nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so finally, you know, let's bring it back to science. Yeah. Because it sounds less scientific to me and more mm. cultural, yeah. um, psychological and all sorts of arty things. Yeah. Do you think that's important for scientists? Yeah, I really do. And maybe that's what got me into this in the first place was, you know, looking at developing that field trip. I was reading this paper about the museum that's opened on the island. It's a really immersive exhibition about you know, history and culture of the eruption. And they've uncovered one of the houses that was lost. But it's really immersive. And this paper was saying all the tourists loved it, all the politicians loved it. But a lot of the older folks on the island, they tried to go and see it to be supportive. And they were suddenly getting like PTSD style responses because of the noise of the eruption or the smell or the seeing of that building they remember differently. And it slightly knocked me sideways, actually, because I'd always been in this science camp, you know, like details person. Oh, details, facts. Yeah. I need to know what is going on and why and how it works. And all of a sudden it wasn't about that. It's about feelings. I was going, oh, yeah, like 50 years ago, those facts were true and those facts are still true. But 50 years on... You know, Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Davis or, you know, whoever can't visit a museum because her experience of something that happened 50 years ago is still impacting her. And you're like, oh, yeah, like as scientists, we turn up and we sample and we collect this and we put that in a machine and then we publish a paper and then we go over there to do something else. And then we go over here to do something else. But for the people living there, this is still going on for 50 years, you know, and the kids growing up in school are learning about it and there might be another eruption at some point. It's really important to understand those long-term impacts. Rianne, thank you so much. What a wonderful thing it was that your parents took you there on <laughs> holiday. And I'm assuming that your paper is yeah. available. Yeah, it's freely accessible. It's open access. On the university website yeah. under your name. Yeah. And I'm very grateful to you for talking to me. Um, do access the uh, the website to have a look at more. I'm, I'm completely fascinated. I'm going to be there <laughs> shortly. So thank you very much for watching. And if you are interested in these podcasts, don't forget that you can find them on the university's websites. They're all fascinating. So thank you very much. My name is Aileen Rees and it's been my pleasure to uh, study some global challenges. And there's nothing more challenging than a volcano. <laughs> Diolch, <Rian. laughs>